good morning. So good to see you here on a beautiful Sunday. A little deceiving, I guess, of what is to come uh, this evening. So we'll be praying for all those folks. We want to even pray in just a moment for those that are in the path of the hurricane. Some of us have family in Louisiana and other places. We'll be praying for them. And certainly we'll have our eyes and ears open to ways that we can minister in the coming days because we certainly know there's going to be opportunities for that. Our church has always been so gracious to be part of disaster relief opportunities, so we don't want to miss those moments that the Lord would give us this morning and in the days to come. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, would you turn to 2 Peter, to 2 Peter chapter number 2, as we continue our series, Stirring Up in You. And this series to look at what Christ would have for us this morning in our lives. We've been talking about this idea of what is Christ stirring up in us, that we're called to pursue the call of Christ's likeness, to look like Christ. And last week we talked about pursuing to the right goal, the right end result, the right uh, process, if you will, the right uh, source of our strength, the source of our wisdom, of our instruction we found was in God's Word as we looked at that deeply last week. And then now I'm going to kind of turn the corner and Peter really is going to uh, really unleash, if you will, uh, a, a torrent of words and of, uh, of warning and of really scathing rebuke of false teachers that were prevalent in that day. And this certainly is a powerful and needed word in the day in which we live. Though perhaps it looks differently, it may sound different, but the ideas are certainly still incredibly relevant. The warnings are there. And it was incredible encouragement to the believers there that Peter was writing to. They were buckling under the weight of the false teachers who were proclaiming that Christ was not going to return and, and Christ had not returned. They were proclaiming you could live this certain way and there would be no consequences and, and nothing to worry about. Just live free and do whatever you want to. And it seemed to be working out for them. And so the Christians of the day were like, wow, this doesn't, is it really worth it? Is this, is it really truth of what I'm following? Can I really trust what Christ has said to us and what the disciples and the apostles were teaching? And so Peter comes in and, and with a, a, a roaring of words that we're going to read that are like, wow. Now there's a lot to be uh, studied here. We could look deeply, deeply into what's here. And there's a lot of um, some challenges in some of this text to figure out exactly what was being referred to. We're going to take the 40,000 foot view. I'd encourage you if you have time later on to do some reading and some commentary reading into Second Peter, but some powerful and encouraging words with this idea in mind that we're called to pursue that call of Christ's likeness, but we're called to proceed with caution. As we navigate the minefields that we find around us, and we find them on a daily basis, we find them on social media, we find people proposing things that are, don't line up with Scripture, and so we have to be so very careful with what we read and what we hear and what we hear people say that they heard or read or saw. We have to be so careful to filter it through God's Word. And, and the reality is, this idea of false teachers is really nothing new. The, the nation of Israel had false prophets. You remember, go back and read with Jeremiah and Isaiah, these minor prophets denouncing the false prophets who were telling Israel, don't worry about it. How you're living is just fine. Judgment's not going to come. These, this king of Assyria will go away. It's not going to be a big deal. All the way into the false, uh, to the early church and the false teachers that would arise, the, the teachings that would come about and the Gnostics and all the different uh, false teachings that would come about that really we even have some of the traces to that even today in which we live. And so Peter's going to warn them. That, that though these false teachers would, would do things like deny that God's judgment was real, deny Christ's deity, deny that there was a call to obedience and sacrifice, deny that ultimately the case that Christ would not return, they would say, well, just live your best life now. There is nothing to come afterwards. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to be concerned about. So just live as you want to. But in reality, as they were doing that, they were leading people. The problem was these were religious people. They, they were saying, well, here's the reality. You act this way and live this way. But in reality, they were enslaved themselves and trying to get others to be enslaved to what they were enslaved to. And so as a result, they would leave people further away from Christ rather than closer to them because they were, though religious, they didn't have an authentic faith. Their lives had not been transformed by the gospel. Peter wants us to know and recognize what is real, what is counterfeit. So we've talked about the last three weeks together what is real. And so now he wants to talk about the counterfeit teaching. He's going to lay out what those look like. And boy, does he bring a stinging word of rebuke and challenge to those who would dare teach 
and preach and show that which was contrary to God's word. So hear these words, a challenge this morning for us, words of encouragement and words of warning and of caution. Look in chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to read the entire chapter together this morning. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master, who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others when he brought, brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example to those who would live ungodly thereafter. And if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-willed, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, where as angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling when they, where they have no knowledge, will in destruction of those creatures also be destroyed." Suffering wrong is the wages of doing wrong. They count it as a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains, they are stains and blemishes reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you. Having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin. Enticing unstable souls. Having a heart trained in greed. Accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved in the wages of righteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgressions. For a dumb donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water and mists driven by a storm for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved." For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse than the first. For it would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returned to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Father, I pray you'd help us to wrap our hearts and minds around this text. This is not a typical text that sometimes preachers preach out of 2 Peter chapter 2. But Lord, I pray that you would, as we work methodically through your word, through books of the Bible like this, Lord, you have some incredibly thing, important things to teach us, to show us, to encourage us, to challenge us, Lord. Be certain of our salvation. Be certain that we're not being enslaved by the things and the ways of this world. Lord, we would find our hope in you, that we would pursue you and Christ's likeness and pursue the right source, your word and, and you. But Lord, maybe this morning, hear these words of caution and warning to be wary, to be wise, to be aware of that which would come against those that would trust you, those that would follow you. Lord, may you give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning what you would have us to hear. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, you can grab an outline there in your chair if you're joining us online. Again, let me tell you how excited we are. You are with us this morning. Uh, you can go to pedalfbc.com slash resources uh, or just click the resource tab rather and the, the handouts will be there. You can follow along 
with us this morning. There are three important truths that Peter wants to grab and get across to us this morning to help us proceed through this minefield, if you will, of false teachers and their clever, twisted version of the truth so that we can be certain we are always on target, on task, to be looking towards the real, unvarnished truth of the gospel. That Jesus is our pursuit, that Jesus is our goal, that eternity in heaven is our calling. And so he says, I want to tell you three things. Number one, that we must expose the lies of the false teachers. We must expose the lies of the false teaching. Simply put, you got to expose their errors. You have to show and point out. Now, it doesn't mean that, that Peter nor myself or anybody else, that we're called to be judges or experts, but instead we're called to be very clear to point out and see what it is that people are teaching, to identify who they really are. And so in this idea of exposing the lies, Peter exposes three lies. Number one, he tells us in verse number one that these kinds of people and their teaching produce destruction. Their teaching produces destruction destruction. Now Jesus had warned his disciples all the way back in Matthew's gospel and now we see it coming to pass and even in 2 Corinthians. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 7 about producing destruction. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as the apostles of Christ. No wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness whose end will be according to their deeds. Boy, the Apostle Paul exposes them just like Peter does. And in the book of Jude, we see the same idea here. For certain persons have crept in, watch this, unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness, right? Lust. Uh, wrong living and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. He says, I want you to be warning. These people will infiltrate quickly. They come under false pretenses. They come in and try to deceive each other. They're almost like a magician with a sleight of hand act, right? Trying to explain to your children that what they see is not really real, right? We're, we watch that America's Got Talent from time to time. And you watch these magicians, these sleight of hand, they're right up in front of you. But the reality is it's not true, right? It's a sleight of hand. It's just simply a deception, they're not magical. They don't have some magic powers. I mean, I've seen one or two people on there that you wonder if they're a little bit, you know, kind of on the edge over there somewhere, some really weird things. But, but by and large, it's just deception. And Paul says, be careful that you see how they work. They're, 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 they're under the father of lies. Satan is the great deceiver. He acts as if it's one way, but in reality, it is another. He, his, his, those that he would send, those false teachers that would come along, would act like they're this one particular way. But in reality, when you study what they're teaching, it actually will produce destruction. They teach what? They deceive and they deny about Christ. They deny the gospel. They will deny that God's word is completely true. Listen, we are in a day and an age where churches in America are saying, well, the Bible is true except for this part of this part of that part. I really don't like this part. And that's not really what God meant or God intended. You hear this often. Listen, you don't have to go very far to find false teaching right here in our own community that would say then deny what God says is truth. Some will say they're a part of Christ's church. They will deny the salvation and sin, the need for a Savior in Christ's return. But I'm going to tell you what, one that's even more dangerous that Peter doesn't really talk about here per se, but it's one that's crept into church, and that is this, is that, and boy, in this, this last two years, and this is going to be a, a hard season to come out of to convince so many to come back to church. They've gotten used to, and I've had conversations with people who have said, well, you know what, preacher, listen, we love our church, we love it, but our weekends have just gotten really full. And more than likely, we probably won't be back. We might maybe come during the week some here and there. But, but by and large, though we, we, we love our church, we're just too busy. We've got other things that have taken the place of that. And, and quite frankly, we seem to be doing just fine. Warning. That is false teaching. That is not from the word of God. His word says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the day draws nearer. Nearer. 
We need each other. We have to have each other. And what Satan's goal is in this season, in my opinion, in my estimation of what I'm looking around and seeing, is that it's this infiltration. It's been around for a couple of decades, by the way, too, that, that really coming to church is not really that big a deal. I mean, if you can get here, good. If not, now online, I get it. We're still in this COVID season, so I understand that. I'm not knocking that by any means. But as we move forward and prayerfully one day get out of this stinking pandemic one day, right, that maybe we'll see those people, we'll pray, we'll come back and return. We'll have this calling to call people back that we need each other we need the church body we we can't serve and practice the one another's by myself at my house right it doesn't work that way we need the influence of the gospel and God's word the teaching of God's word and the fellowship of other believers again this teaching has been creeping in for decades in the church that weekends and Sundays are for all kinds of other things And if church can be squeezed in there somewhere, then that's good. But if not, then there's a challenge that we have to work through that process of understanding that Satan wants to sneak in. And listen, remember, it's just a sleight of hand. It's just very subtle. It's very small. It's seemingly sometimes very insignificant. What does he say here about the false teachers here? He says, we see how they work, what they teach, where they're headed. Now listen, Peter admits no words here. It's destruction. Peter says, they will clearly reap what they sow. And and sometimes do you wonder when you live and walk right, you wonder, is it really worth it? I mean, is it really worth it in the end? Am I really going to, is it really going to pay off? It seems like I look at these people over here that are living this way and their life seems so great. They don't seem to have any consequences, especially as a teenager. These are challenging words for teenagers because they look at their friends and their friends look so happy. They can go and live this certain lifestyle and live like this and, and nothing seems to happen. So is it really worth it? And Peter is reminding his readers who are asking the same questions. Is it really worth it? The answer is yes. Because one day, if not now, later, destruction will come to them. And it will come when they least expect it. So take heart this morning. We see false teaching produces destruction. Secondly, they distort the gospel. The Bible says here in verse number 2 that many will follow In Peter's day, there was no doubt that many who once were seemingly a part of the church were no longer. They were following these false teachings. And and the reality was because these teachers were distorting the gospel, taking what was true and just twisting it just ever so slightly. There will be many who will claim to be believers, but their lifestyle and their words and their actions and their deeds do not line up with that which they profess to be true. Romans 2.24 talks of this distortion. For the name of God is blasting among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. He says to these people, you're, you're, the name of Christ being blasphemed. Why? Because of how you're living. You say you're one thing, but in reality, you live an entirely different thing. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 3, giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited. Paul was telling them, let's not live in any way that would bring discredit, that would bring harm to the gospel, that would distort the gospel. Because the reality is we see there that there was a temptation that these false teachers were bringing to live in a sensual way. Sexual morality was a huge part of what was being taught then. That you can live this lifestyle. Adultery talks about all these different things a little bit later on. That you can live that way and there's no consequence. In fact, they would say this is all a part of being a part of, of religion in this regard of what they were teaching as falsehood. And the Bible says many would follow them. Well, we see that today. I mean, we, we just see it as an epidemic over these last two years. The divorce rate, I, I don't know what it will end up being in the last two years. But I can tell you, as a pastor, the number of couples and people I've seen that are struggling through marriages is exponentially higher than it was prior to a pandemic. That so many have bought into the lies of what Satan would say to be true. And that it's acceptable and that God just wants you to be happy. No, God wants us to be obedient. God wants to make us holy. God wants to make us more like Him. And so He says here, the the reality is though is that it tarnishes the gospel when when we even as believers live the way the world lives and we can bring discredit to what He called here the way. That's what He's referring to is how early Christians were talked about as followers of the way. It would tarnish the credibility. Their lives would discredit the gospel. Thirdly, they would exploit believers. These false teachers would exploit believers. You know what they were exploiting? They wanted their money. 
Listen, the prosperity gospel we see today, we, we get to see it live on TV and in other places on the television set of, you know, if, if you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, and that means you're really a true follower of Jesus. And if you send me $100, God's going to bless you and turn into 1000 Let me send you a little handkerchief I sneezed in, and it'll be bless you and it'll be holy and sanctified, right? You see these kind of preachers all around. It was, it's nothing new. We see the same thing in Second Peter. They were after what? They were after money. You find some of these folks that are flying, you know, Gulfstream jets and they, they, they live in massive houses. You don't find that in God's word. It's not what the gospel's about. And so they bring discredit, but they exploit believers and those who are gullible and those who would not see what the false teachers were about. You see, these false teachers are worried about one thing, about money. How could they live more comfortably? How could they take advantage of those who didn't know? So number one, we have to clearly expose the lies of false teaching. Secondly, Peter says, we must encounter a clear picture of God's justice. Now listen, we love to talk about God as love, and that is so very important. But we must never, ever forget that God's love is always a part of God's justice. Sometimes I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, in my lifetime, I can remember looking at my dad sometimes. I would look over at friends of mine in, in, in high school, and I would see that, man, they would... They would cheat on tests, and I would struggle. Good night, I would struggle. I just, it was a struggle sometimes in school, and I would look at them, and they were making A's, A pluses. And I'm like, it's not fair. That's not right. And they would never get caught. And I just wanted, I'd want to tattletale on them and say, well, I wanted to get the F they deserve because they didn't study one iota. Some of them had gotten copies of teacher's tests. I mean, they just, they had, they, they would just, and I was like, this is not, this is not fair. But the reality is what we have to see is is that God's justice always will happen. And Peter was reminding these believers, listen, I want to remind you that, listen, God isn't fair, thank goodness. God is just. It doesn't matter whether you've lived a good or an evil life in the regard that God's justice will come. They were saying that it didn't really matter if you were good or evil. That didn't really matter. That God didn't really care. That God doesn't discriminate between the two. When the reality is, of course, he does. There will be a certain judgment of the ungodly and a preservation of the godly. Ultimately, the Bible says these false teachers will be destroyed. And those that are true believers will be delivered. He tells them three things about it in verse, the second part of verse 3. The promise of God's justice. What he was saying is the, the, the false teachers were saying basically God had fallen asleep. They would have said that God was this uh, old man with a beard and had gotten really sleepy and tired of all the stuff he was having to do. So he just got tired so... He was asleep at the wheel. He didn't really know what was going on. And Peter says, no, 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 that is exactly the opposite of the case, that the Lord is fully awake. In fact, in 2 Chronicles, it says the Lord's eyes look to and fro throughout the earth to see whose hearts are totally his. God is at work. And he promises that God will bring about his justice. Though in our timing, it may be slow. It may not be when we want it to happen, but it will happen. God's promises are true. Secondly, he says, the pattern of God's justice. In verses 4 through 8, we see God, God, uh, Peter gives this pattern and some specific examples. Really, as given God's track record was on display. He wants to give this pattern or some pictures of what God's judgment actually looked like. He gives us two sets of pictures. I'm just going to tell you about just very quickly. Two sets. One is of those of the wicked and what happened. And the second set is those who were godly and what happened to them. Right? He, the first one he talks about is the fallen angels. Right? The fallen angels. These were once a part of those who had worshipped with the host of heaven, who had rebelled against God, and who were followers of Satan, his demons. Perhaps these were the ones described in Genesis chapter 6 that crossed the boundaries between the spirit world and human flesh. We don't know exactly specifically which one they're talking about, but the bottom line, he says, they were condemned to the utter darkness Jude echoes this in Jude chapter of verses 6 and 7. It says, And angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds and under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them, since in the same way as they indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. In other words, these, these angels have been in darkness. They've been there for, for centuries. And they'll be there until the ultimate judgment of God is given. 
He says, listen, God's going to give his track record. I've taken care of these. Not only the angels, secondly, the ancient world that was referred to in this chapter uh, of Jude, verse 7. Also in Genesis chapter 6, it refers to the ancient world that was completely depraved. And God decided, I've had enough. I'm going to destroy the world. It had gotten so wicked, it was unredeemable, save for Noah and his family. Thirdly, the indecent cities, right? The Sodom and Gomorrah, we know about those. Those are often referred to. Even people today talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. And even those cities, even though God gave them multiple opportunities, Lot even pled on their behalf. They could not find even five righteous people in the city. And so God, now listen, this is literal. This is not some, some idea. And I don't know how exactly this happens. Is a volcano or how this all worked out? I don't know. But the Bible says that fire and ash rained down on that city. Brimstone, it leveled both of those cities. So God's saying, listen, I've got a track record. When I say I'm going to do what I'm going to do, it's going to happen. It may take a long time before you see it happen. It may not happen in your lifetime. But God says, trust me that my justice will prevail. And it gives three pictures of those who walked righteously. The first one, Noah. We all know the story story of Noah. Genesis chapter 6 verses 8 through 13 where Noah was a righteous man. God asked him to do the most ludicrous, crazy thing ever in history. Build a boat on dry land. Noah was telling people that had never seen rain before, it's going to rain. And Noah takes himself and seven others, his wife and his, his his three children and their wives, And puts them on a boat. And God saves Noah. And starts all over again. Secondly, we see the example, or thirdly, the example of Lot. Now, here the Bible calls him a righteous man. You go read Genesis in the account of Lot. He was not the most righteous dude in the world. I mean, the guy had kind of crept over all the way over to Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? He eventually lives in Sodom and Gomorrah. But the Bible says that he was a righteous man. The Bible says he was bothered by the sin and the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, he wasn't bothered enough to get out. He was bothered by what he saw. And eventually, Lot leaves, and God's urging, and his family is saved, except for his wife, who turns around and is turned to a pillar of salt. But we know that God saved Lot. We could go to many, many other examples throughout Scripture that would remind us of God's justice. That God will protect and provide. Because then we go to the third part, the provision of God's justice in verses 9 and 10. The provision of God's justice. We see God's clear provision in the present moments. We got the if statements. If God did this, if God did that, if God did that, then verse 9 says, well then this must also be true. That he will rescue the godly from their trials. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't have trials. It doesn't mean you won't have temptations. It doesn't mean you won't have struggles. But it says that he will rescue the godly from those. Now, sometimes that means different kinds of things. It might be in the very beginning of it. It might be at the very end of it. It might be after it's already over with. It might mean it means we're delivered to eternity. There's some in, in Afghanistan, we keep talking about them, but our, our hearts as we continue to hear stories coming out of Afghanistan, true stories from our IND and other places that talk about these Christian pastors who the Taliban and the ISIS are hunting them down, literally. And listen, they, they, this rescue the godly from the trial, some of them, their rescue will be an eternity in heaven. They will be martyred for their faith. They will kill their families. So God wants the, the, those in Peter's time who are facing this kind of persecution, that he will rescue you, whether it's in eternity in heaven, or I may even do it right now, depending on God's sovereign and perfect plan. But our call is to trust God will, will take care of us. And listen, God will provide for us. James talks about this in 1 Corinthians. He will provide a way of escape. God is not the one who, who tempts, but God provides a way of escape. Our call is to count it all joy when we encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of that faith will produce endurance, an endurance of its perfect result, that you will be complete, lacking in nothing, James says. God says, I will rescue you. Secondly, he says, I reserve the, the godless for torment. Boy, Peter makes it abundantly clear. And again, we don't often preach these kinds of texts because if we really read them for what they are, it'll make us shiver just a little bit, to be honest with you. God says in verse number nine, let me listen to it. It says, keeps the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Listen, there is a day that every single person will answer for how they've lived their life. We, we, we put that off. We don't want to think about that. But Peter reminds us that is the truth. 
God says, I have reserved my judgment for those who are wicked, for those who turn their back on me, for those who would lead other people astray. Thirdly, finally, Peter reminds them that we must examine the reality and the impact of the false teachers. We must examine the reality and the impact. He says, I want you to really look at the lives of these false teachers. Look at how they're living. Now, I know they're saying this, but how they're actually living and walking. And look at the impact their lifestyle had on themselves and then on those that they were teaching and those who were influenced and following their ways. Peter exposes them in no uncertain terms. In fact, he brings harsh words of God's judgment against these people. He says three things about them. Number one, their corruption is extreme. Listen, the Bible says that these people weren't just kind of flirting with sin. They weren't just kind of on the edge. Listen, they were indulging. They were reveling. The Bible says here, Peter says, in the daytime, even for Romans and Greeks, this most pagan of lifestyle was reserved for the night, for the darkness. Here it says they were doing it in the broad, open daylight. They were hiding nothing. And they were trying to bring as many people along with them as they possibly could. We see it kind of explained in three different ways. The first one was pride and arrogance in verses 10 to 13. They were, they says they were above the authority of anybody in this world. They don't have to answer to anyone. Yet the Bible reminds us that we as even believers are called to answer to those that are in government, those that are in charge of us. By nature, we as Americans, more than ever in our history, seem to struggle with authority, don't we? It's a struggle. It's a balance of where does that line cross? But here, they go far beyond that. that they don't have, no, no one has authority. Them, even those in the spirit world. They were so full of pride, so full of themselves, so bold, that the Bible says here, even the spirits were reviled by these kinds of people. Now that says something, doesn't it? Other verses you can look at later, just time would limit us, but some great verses are James and John, 1 John and Titus talk about these same things. Pride and arrogance. Secondly, lust. We've referred to it already, the sexual sins that were rampant and completely out of control. They were espousing things that were not, uh, were contrary rather to God's word. And boy, do we live in that same day and age now. Where what was once unacceptable is now acceptable. What once was, was maybe in the dark is now in the light and is celebrated. And what was once something we would say no way that now we say, well, maybe there's a way. Or maybe, and again, now we're having to change the definitions of, of biology and change the definitions of, of what is once was not acceptable. Well, I can kind of go outside the bounds of the boundaries of marriage sometimes. God will understand. God wants me to be happy. I mean, we hear these phrases over and over and over again. Listen, this is exactly what Peter's talking about. It's a false teaching. The sexual sin was even running into the the love feast, the the celebration of the Lord's Supper. These false teachers were going in and looking and trying to find the vulnerable and pick them off. Lastly, they talked about the gain and the greed. Well, they take this even further. There was this unbridled pursuit of money. Right? It's all about money. It's all about comfort and ease. You see the three, probably probably the three greatest sins any of us struggle with, pride and lust and greed. Peter identifies these. The false teachers would expose and would, would pounce on those three things that many of us can be vulnerable to, all of us can be vulnerable to. Then he gives the illustration of Balaam the donkey. True story, you go back and look, and you have not time to read it, but go back in the story when Balaam was hired by one of the, the kingdoms to curse Israel, and God would never let it happen. In fact, every time Balaam would open his mouth, he would speak blessings instead of curses. But Balaam was hard-headed, so he kept on this path, and he was on a donkey, and this donkey kept like scraping against the wall of the mountain, and he got so he's beating this donkey, slapped to death, and finally God gives the donkey the ability to speak. Basically, well, I mean, he basically says, you, you are dumb, Balaam. <laughs> he speaks to him and says, listen, I'm saving your life. There's an angel right here who's about to strike you down to get his attention. He gives Balaam as an example of a false teacher. Their corruption is extreme. Secondly, their doctrine is empty. Their doctrine is empty. And the reality, these false teachers didn't really believe what they were teaching. They knew it wasn't true. They knew it to be a farce. Because they weren't even living by themselves what they were proclaiming to be true. He says two things here in verse 17 and 18 and then 19. talks about how their speech was like mist. They 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 sounded so great. It sounded so, so wonderful and warm and fuzzy. But it was nothing more than a mist that just simply dissipated and disappeared. 
It was showy. It was impressive. Their speech was, sounded like something they were experts in, but they were really far from it. They had no secret knowledge. And then the second part here is they, the promise of false freedom. Right? It says that they were encouraging them to be a part of something that they were already enslaved to. Well, come run into the same thing with me, and you'll experience freedom. I'll never forget a pastor, uh, a speaker one time who talked about this idea of freedom. He went to visit a, a teenager, one of his uh, high school or maybe he's in college age, and this kid was rebellious and found himself in an addiction rehab center. And the man was still, the young man was still rebellious and spitting off words of, of spewing hatred and, and said, you know, I'm free to do whatever I want to do, and I'm, I'm free. I can live how I want to. Nobody can tell me how I want to live. And the speaker said, God just really spoke to me and said, well, friend, if you're so free, why is it that in just a moment I'm going to walk out of this door a free man? And you'll be still here for another six months. You see, you're not really free. These false teachers were promising freedoms that would never deliver freedom, only slavery. Lastly, their true nature was exposed. We must see their true nature is exposed. In verses 20 to 23, we see the reality of who they were was made abundantly clear. Now, really, you could read this two ways. One, he's talking about false teachers, but then he's talking about a second group of people, perhaps. Either could possibly be true in this text of those who claim to be followers of Christ, but in reality, we're not. And listen, we believe as Southern Baptists, we believe the Baptist faith and message is based on God's word that is the security of the believer. If a person is genuinely, truly transformed by the power of the gospel, nothing can ever change that. Let's be crystal clear about that. But here, Peter is talking about those who, the reality was, they may have said some words. They may have even come to church. They may have even been a part of a church. But the reality was, the truth was, their lives had never been transformed. Their lives looked far, far more like the world than that of Jesus. Maybe they understood the gospel. Maybe they heard some stories about the gospel. They heard some things about God, but they didn't really know him as their Savior, and as their Lord. They had some head knowledge, but had little to no heart knowledge. And here Peter says that the illustration of a dog and a pig, that a dog's nature, back then you can see it in third world countries, dogs by and large are not pets. They're not these sweet animals that we, <laughs> that we dress up and we feed steak to. And you go to a Third world country, and there are many ravenous dogs you avoid at all costs. A pig, you can clean up a pig, make it look shiny and pretty, but put it back out in the pig pen, and what is a pig going to do every single time? Go back and walla in the mud. We see the same picture, he says, of those who claim that, but in reality, they're nothing more than a dog who returns to its vomit or a pig that returns back to the pig pen. So these words this morning are words to remind us, but also they're words to encourage us, I believe, that we see, not that we wish judgment on anyone, that we want God's wrath to be poured out on anyone. We don't want it in our own lives, much less anybody else's lives. But we see in the truth and the reality that God's justice is not slow. Slow in our timing? Oh yes, absolutely sometimes. But God wants us to see the reality. But not only that, to warn us to be so very careful in this day and age of what you listen to, what you read, who you're around, that you allow to speak truth into your life, into the lives of your children. Listen, what they're seeing, what they're reading, what they're experiencing at school, what they, they'll see on the internet, what they'll see in videos, so much of it is so contrary to the word of God. And it's so subtle. You have to watch it. Right, I, I just in my mind, I think of I think of my daughter. There are times that it's it's on the Disney Channel. I got to change the channel, Disney Junior, because of what comes across that screen, and it's so subtle and it's so so small and so easy to miss. We have to be so careful. We teach our children to know the truth, and that we see the truth and we teach them the truth. Remember, we're only one generation away. Only one generation away from the truth going completely out the door. So may we today make a fresh commitment to be certain to be pursuing Christ's likeness by pursuing the right source and being proceeding with caution through the minefield 
And maybe for some of you to be encouraged today. Living right is worth it. It pays off in the end. It's the right choice. Father, I pray this morning as we wrap up our time together. Lord, these words, I know they're unique words, not words, again, that we normally hear and talk about. Lord, your justice. And Lord, we see your track record of faithfulness. Lord, we see your track record of that you promised to do exactly what you said you will do. And that if we'll live and walk with you, that, Lord, there is a reward at the end. And, Lord, those that would choose to not walk that way, there is also your justice to be meted out on their life. So, Lord, I pray for any person this morning that is watching online this morning or in this building. Lord, I pray that they know you as Savior. Lord, if they don't for some reason, Lord, that they would... Lord, take this moment to evaluate their lives. Lord, does their lives line up with the word of God says about those that are followers of Jesus? Have their li- has their life been completely transformed and changed by the power of the gospel? Lord, if it hasn't, then today they would admit to you they're a sinner. They would ask you to forgive them of all their sins. They would believe that you're the son of God, confess you as their savior, commit their life to you as Lord. And Lord, they would be transformed. Lord, not just to say those words, but Lord, feel convicted over their need for you and over their sin and their need for a Savior in their life. And that you would begin that transformative work that would change them from who they were to who you want them to become. For others of us this morning, Lord, sometimes we get discouraged. We wonder if living this lifestyle that's pleasing to you sometimes, is it really worth it? Does it really pay off? And Lord, these words remind us it absolutely 100% is. Lord, that you are the way, the truth, and the life that we can trust in you. Lord, as we come to the altar this morning, Father, in our hearts, maybe even physically this morning, whatever it is that you're calling us to do, Lord, that there will be some decisions we need to make in regards to what we've heard this morning. Or maybe something, Lord, that's not even related to what we talked about. But, Lord, you spoke to us during the, during the music time together, our prayer time together. God, may we be obedient to respond to the truths that you're calling us to this morning. And may we be encouraged to follow you. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.